So our next speaker has only been in America for about 12 months. And she spent three of those months, and I want to make sure you get the direction correct, going from the West Coast to the East Coast on Amtrak in 2021. So I want everyone to think about what that was like. Because I know this is sort of this uh, romantic ideal. And I want to hear if she was in sleeper cars or regular seats, like how much it's just like, oh, going from one city to the next and waiting a week or spending overnight in sleeper cars. So I'm really interested in seeing how that all went because there's a sort of like romanticism about riding the, the train across country. So everyone, please welcome Surabi. Um, hello, everyone. Thank you so much for having me here today. My name is Surabi Hodigere, and I'm going to be talking about uh, best practices for the governance of digital public goods. These are primarily research findings from a research report that I worked on housed at the Ash Center, the Harvard Kennedy School, and supported by the Rockefeller Foundation. So very excited to dive in and take you through this, um, to the, through the preliminary findings of our report. Um, to start with, I'd like to acknowledge that I'm here on behalf of a fantastic team led by lecturer at the Kennedy School, David Eaves, um, you, some of you might know him, and also my colleagues, Leonie and Omaira, who could not be joining us today, but have given me this responsibility to introduce our uh, report to you all. So um, what are we talking about today? We're talking about digital public goods. I don't know if you've heard of the term or not, but digital public goods are um, essentially categorized as free and um, are categorized as such when they're freely and openly available with minimal restrictions on how they can be adapted, distributed, and reused. So they're essentially um, public goods, but for the digital space, that's how we're thinking about them. Now, there's one thing that makes digital public goods incredibly different from public goods that we know of in economics and otherwise, which is that term that I've highlighted, the minimal restrictions. So when DPGs, that's how we'll call them as we go about in this talk, um, they voluntarily agree to restrictions, restrictions on who makes decisions on the development roadmap, what the requirements are on the membership fee, membership criteria, all of this to main, ensure that there is a commonality and uh, between the sort of reuse that, they, that can be brought as well as to ensure that costs are come down. Just to give you a quick example, I wanted to uh, introduce my favorite DPG, which is the X Road in Estonia, an integrated infrastructure that allows for data sharing between Estonia, Finland, Iceland, and is governed by the Nordic Institute for Interoperability Solutions. This is a DPG that we have referenced throughout our report and really is in some ways uh, a guiding DPG for, for a lot of research. Now, going forward, um, why did we choose to spend 12 months of our time thinking about digital public goods governance? Like I mentioned, when digital public goods are come together or digital public goods exist, they do so through minimal restrictions. These restrictions are important for the very existence of a digital public good because they ensure that it's both restricted as well as coordinated in such a way that the digital public good doesn't splinter into different bespoke solutions. Instead, it is the governance in itself that allows for this coordination and then thus the restriction. I know it's a lot maybe to follow for people who are not in this part of the, you know, who are not thinking about this world, but stay with me as we go forward. Um, <clears throat> We decide this is why we focused on governance, and we felt that a digital public good without governance is indeed not a digital public good at all. Gov just picking up code, uh, public sector code, throwing it on GitHub does not necessarily make it open, it uh, does not necessarily make it a digital public good. Um, and that's where we feel that governance comes in to set certain norms, standards, to ensure that additional public good really lives up to its public good part. Um, governance, we think, is time-consuming. Governance, we think, is hard. Of course, that there are uh, these constraints. The risks, however, especially on, on emergent and small digital public goods, is high. And therefore, we think that governance is indeed essential. You might be wondering, 
why am I talking about something in digital public good lingo when all of this seems so much similar to open source? Um, after all, digital public goods are open source uh, products. They have that is a requirement as per the definition that has been set by the Digital Public Good Alliance based on the UN report that we um, that we have referenced. But what differentiates digital public goods from open source solutions? Four things that we have recognized. One is that intentionality. OS projects are often born in, in a very organic manner. Think Linux, think all your big sort of open source um, communities, whereas DPGs are <clears throat> more definitely more mature, relatively more mature and intentional and defined. Equity, a big concern for anybody working in the government space. Um, OS projects don't necessarily have this as a focus, but um, and, and often uh, open source projects can lead to underrepresentation of certain groups because it might it's not intentional, whereas the government needs to always keep in mind equity concerns. Um, sustainability, again, because of the nature of open source projects, they have uh, different sustainability uh, or, or, or often un very unclear sustainability uh, models, whereas with uh, digital public goods, it is a big criteria. So sustainability is a big criteria. In terms of um, capacity, again, um, not everybody is, not every government is equipped to attract as well as retain developers um, as large corporations or organic uh, open source projects can do, which is why we differentiate uh, digital public goods from open source and have spent this much time sort of focusing on um, this very niche category of uh, public goods that is. Uh, uh, that is emerging in the world. So coming back to governance, where does governance fit? There's all of these other facets to a digital public good that could have been studied. Uh, I told you why we focused in on the governance module. And however, I want to recognize that policies, thinking about funding, especially funding, assessment capabilities, all of these are all incredible uh, parts that we do hope that others conduct research on and I, I and I could also reference a few others who have conducted research on the same issues. What do we mean by governance? Um, the key decisions uh, around governance, who makes the decisions and who decides who makes the decisions? This I think is, is the crux of what we've been trying to figure out as well as the development of a roadmap. How is it done? Um, this is what we will refer to as strategy as we go forward. Of course, there are other peripheral decisions as well. Who can participate in developing, maintaining the DPG? And uh, given that it's an open source, inherently open source sort of product, how do you enforce community norms and rules? These is, this is how we're defining what uh, governance is in this entire uh, spectrum. What did we do? Essentially, this was the fun part of um, my grad school life in the last 12 months. Um, spent a good amount of time reading literature on governance and open source for somebody who has no technical background and, and you know has to go through all that jargon. It was a lot of fun to do, um, but learned a lot through this literature li review and we focused it on governance and OS, like I said. Um, conducted more incredible interviews with leading experts who guided our recommendation and um, with existing uh, leaders in the digital public good space. This was um, conducted across different time zones in the world, thanks to Zoom. Our lim we did have two limiting factors though, and that is um, that the, there was only a small number of DPGs which have robust governance structures. NICE, as I mentioned, is, is, is one of those, the Nordic Institute of Interoperability Solutions. Um, and of course, uh, as anybody in the public sector would attest to, the visibility and access to governance failures. So we really didn't know whether some, you know, when something goes wrong, nobody wants to talk about it, especially in government. Um, so visibility and access to government, uh, access to governance failures was uh, definitely poor. poor. Um, which is, those were our limiting factors. I want to very quickly um, run through the two frameworks that we used that, um, 
One is uh, Mark Moore's strategic triangle, born here at the Harvard uh, Kennedy School, essentially that focuses on uh, balancing three different angles or three different important considerations, leg legitimacy, legitimacy and support, public value and operational capability to create any sort of net uh, public value. This is, a, this is a framework that we have used in this in in our analysis and some of you might be aware of this this is uh, simon wadley's maturity mapping uh, where we've we have taken different tpgs uh, which have different goals and levels of maturity and and sort of map them in this in this spectrum of whether they're from experimental to um, you know standardized infrastructure so bespoke solutions and product in between um, yeah so those were the two frameworks that we used it's um, academic report so we made sure to uh, reference these frameworks throughout our work. Now, I will very quickly sort of um, jump into our uh, recommendations and sort of take you through this for the next 10 minutes. So the first, the first, um, and my slides are, yeah, okay. Um, so the first recommendation, or we like to call it a playbook because after all, you know, you don't necessarily want to, um, give out a bunch of bunch of to dos that um, DPGs that have very varying goals and contexts, as well as different sort of um, 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 uh, intentions to um, say that this is exactly what you want to follow. So we've been flexible in what we have said is 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 observed across different DPGs, emerging DPGs, as well as <clears throat> mature DPGs. And here's something that you could be doing. Here's something you could try. Um, so the first first two, however, are um, finding a vision and mission value statement as well as drafting a code of conduct. We have recommended to everyone. It seems very, you know, it seems very basic. At least that's how I thought about it when when we were thinking through that any any sort of organization, any product coming together would be would sit down and think through finding a, a mission, vision, value statement, but. It was important to sort of say that this is a requirement for a DPG to think through. Um, and, and I think expecting this in the public sector is, is really holding um, the organization to a higher standard already. So let me just dive into um, the first of our recommendation. What it allows, as you all know, it's you know a vision, mission, MVP statement allows for um, the purpose and the objectives to be clearly articulated and and therefore through the articulation it allows for uh, it to shape strategic decision making um, and our guidance here is that really invest in a well-defined MVV as a starting point because this will allow for um, DPGs to think about what the government's design should be centered on and how it maximizes public value um, on the right hand side you'll see that this is applicable to all of the um, all sort of levels of maturity of the DPGs and it maximizes public value in the more strategic triangle. Going forward, drafting a code of conduct. Again, several open source communities have, uh, we've heard case studies, you know, heard stories essentially about how managing contributive behavior, who leads, who makes decisions, what sort of uh, norms should be followed has been a cause of concern. And um, which is why we, we recommend as a best practice to um, come up with a code of conduct for contributors and really sort of put this out in the open so that everybody's on the same page with respect to this um, code of conduct. The third recommendation that we have had is the crux of you know what what we've been trying to work on, which is how do you design governance bodies? I know there's a lot of technical folks in this conference, and of course it's called the R conference. And and often what happens is that you know this might be an afterthought, but through our report and through our through this particular recommendation, in fact, we've tried to bring the focus on how governance designing governance bodies is essentially not should not be an afterthought, and institutionalizing you know authority and accountability for decisions, especially for digital public goods, which which are intentional, which start at the uh, with a very with a lot of um, with a lot of maturity sometimes, um, ensure ensuring that they have a. Uh, a governance design, you know, they design their governance from the start is incredibly important. And the one thing that we felt really works, uh, or rather we've, we've um, observed in, in our research that works is 
which is an emerging best practice, is that separating the strategy and the technology implementation and allocating different sort of decision rights and responsibility to each um, has been um, has been something that we've we've seen ensures a better sort of governance design. The strategy board would be focused on roadmap and community uh, wide decisions, whereas the technology board would be focused on uh, you know code and managing that and day to day operations. So this is this is our this is our uh, third recommendation very quickly going forward. Um, an important concern, especially with respect to our equity value, is that we've observed a lot of dilemma in what happens when decision-making culture becomes very unanimous uh, stakeholder, and, and also when what happens when a DPG scales. So for when a, a digital public goods scales, we've noticed that stakeholders that control the st strategy board essentially control the direction of the DPG. While we're not making a recommendation or a guidance in this specific case, we are saying that this is something that DPGs should be cog cognizant about. Um, and this, the second and third observation that we saw was that uh, unanimous decision making and a lack of sort of uh, have, taking all stakeholders together, um, the guidance that we're putting forth is that, of course, design for plurality and uplifting voices uh, very intentionally from resource constrained stakeholders. Um, and, and the last and final recommendation that our, our playbook part that we've had is um, this fantastic uh, you know, part about open source is that it allows for contributions. And therefore, we've noticed amongst existing DPGs that there are um, three types of contributors, voluntary contributors, contributors who are either paid by an external entity or paid for by members of the community. And DPGs can engage these external contributors through um, a multi a three, three types, essentially, uh, formalized, without any sort of formalized structure, without uh, or with a formalized structure that has a contribution mechanism, but also a third type, which is, um, which my slides are eating up for some reason, but a formalized um, a structure which has a governance consideration as well. Of course, the third one is something that we would recommend, but um, at, at the least, we would say that it's essential to have formalized contribution mechanisms and not stick with the um, lack of any, any such thing. Um, I have no idea how I'm doing on time, but I would like to thank you all for uh, listening to our talk, I really hope that this, my talk, I really hope that this was informative. And like I mentioned, these are preliminary data findings, uh, research findings, and we will be publishing this report in the next few months. I hope to share it with the our conference community. Uh, in the meanwhile, please feel free to reach out to me. My email ID is just my first name and last name at hks.harvard.edu, and I'm on Twitter as well. Um, I'm very open to uh, hearing your thoughts. This is a very niche subject that we've we've just picked up on, and uh, we're very excited to uh, you know publish it and take it forward, and also hear all your feedback. So thank you so much for this opportunity, and thank you for listening. <laughs>